Hello and welcome to a special segment of Getting High on Anthropology. My name is Lucia Turpak. I'm a graduate student of medical anthropology at the University of Colorado Denver. Uh, joining us today, we have a special guest, mental health counselor and psychedelic researcher, Rafael Ancelotta. So thanks so much for being on the show, Rafael. Yeah, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so just to start, I'd love to just tell the audience a little bit more about what you do at Innate Path. Sure. So Innate Path is a psychedelic assisted therapy clinic. Um, and we work primarily with cannabis and ketamine, well, solely cannabis and ketamine, mm -hmm. um, in order to facilitate a therapeutic process. Um, and we combine that with a somatically informed therapy that um, essentially operates on the idea that trauma and um, stress is stored in the body. Mm -hmm. And so we use these medicines as what we call expressive medicines in order to allow for the nervous system to um, release that stored energy or stress. Yeah, really interesting. Mm -hmm. So what's the difference between ketamine and cannabis when, you know, in the in context of the therapy? Um, and are there certain types of patients that you use each medicine with? So what's, what's interesting about doing this work is that the more that I do it and the more that I talk to other people doing this kind of work, especially when uh, the focus is the somatic process, mm -hmm. it really doesn't matter what medicine is used. And so, um, so I, while there isn't solid research on this, um, I would venture to say that there is some, um, there's some similarities between what all these medicines are doing mm -hmm. and uh, essentially gaining more access to what's in the subconscious. Mm -hmm. and, um, and ultimately when the, when the rational mind is kind of moved to the side, mm. then the nervous system is able to uh, express itself more freely. And so, um, so some medicines can be more supportive uh, like ketamine or um, you know, right now there's a lot of research on MDMA happening. Mm -hmm. Those medicines can be more supportive or resourcing than something like cannabis or psilocybin, which can be a little bit um, more challenging for some mm -hmm. people. But ultimately, the somatic process looks very much the same, regardless of what medicine is being used. Yeah, so you keep on bringing up, you know, the nervous system, mm -hmm. somatic processes. Um, is that the, the key then, do you think, to the success of these therapies? Like what exactly is going on? Um, and a second question, what's missing from more traditional therapies, like something like talk therapy? Well, I, I ultimately think that every kind of therapy has great potential. Mm -hmm. And I think that ultimately um, what, do I th what I think is happening is ultimately mm -hmm. Um, I think what works in therapy is it's based on how useful and how effective the relationship is mm. between the therapist and the client. And, you know, there's research that's been uh, done on this with a wide range of different therapeutic modalities. And ultimately what it comes back to is the relationship, the human mm -hmm. relationship that people have. Mm. And so in, in terms of specifically psychedelic assisted therapy and, and where that comes into play is that I think that the these medicines help to facilitate certain uh, things that may be more difficult to access mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. that may take a lot longer time and so one of the biggest challenges with ptsd treatment mm -hmm. specifically is that there's a high dropout rate you know people are suffering and trauma happens relationally and so um, people because they're suffering so much people really are looking for relief and if they don't get that relief very quickly then it's easy to kind mm -hmm. of just be like okay this isn't working for me this is too hard uh -huh. so with uh, with psychedelic assisted therapies it tends to be a little bit quicker in terms of getting into what are what needs to be worked through mm. and so you know and, and by working through the nervous system um, we're not dealing with as many of the defense mechanisms that the rational mind has set up. And so instead we're working with the nervous system, mm. which has its own innate intelligence. 
and we allow that nervous system to just express itself over time and and by being gentle in that way and being supportive in that way i think that that helps um, helps people particularly with ptsd mm. move into that process it's a little bit quicker but it it takes time mm -hmm. and, and i think that that's one of the things that a lot of people are missing with a lot of these therapies is that while they can speed up the process to a degree it still takes time you still need to develop that relationship mm -hmm. and developing human relationships takes time it's not something that you know just because you've spent you know two hours with someone while under the influence of a substance that doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to trust that person mm -hmm. faster mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know so it still takes time um, it's still a process and it, it's still hard work what does a typical cannabis or ketamine assisted uh, therapeutic session look like and um, how does the patient react how involved are you as a therapist so with the medicine sessions it can it's different it's different every time um, we usually do two or three preparatory sessions to teach our clients like how to navigate that space, how this modality works, especially the, the body-centered modality because a lot of people are more focused to just talking about their problems or talking about what happened instead of paying attention to what's happening in their body. Mm -hmm. So we do a lot of education and a lot of preparation before there's any medicine on board. And during the medicine sessions, um, you know, I mean, it, it's a, it would be a very long explanation to explain like all the different things that could happen and, and how that works. But essentially, um, we are spending the session really focusing on the body and just allowing the body to, to take over and to express itself, um, which I understand is vague, but it would just, because it's very complex, like we spend several hours um, working on building the education around it. Um, yeah, it, I think kind of a general overview is that, you know, the sessions are spent really just paying attention to the body, letting things come up, and then uh, allowing them to process through, which could lead to re-experiencing memories. Um, it could lead to just simply feeling like a lot of painful sensations or even really pleasurable sensations. So just kind of guiding someone through that process and, and bringing attention to different things that, that come up throughout the session. Yeah, thanks for that. I think, so I think when the average person thinks about, you, you know, we call, we call it mental health. Um, mm -hmm. I think a lot of us are wondering about our minds. Why are you, why is Innate Path so focused on the body when we're talking about mental health? Yeah, so the, the mind and the body are part of a unified system. And so I think for a very long time, especially in Western medicine, we've viewed the body into these separate organs and separate categories. And instead, we're starting to pay attention to realize, well, the whole system relies on all of it in order to function. So the brain is paying attention to feedback from the body and, and vice versa. So we also, um, you know, there's a lot of information and research coming out about um, the, the somatic process, the body-focused process in relation to trauma mm -hmm. and how much the body stores. So uh, researchers like Bessel van der Kolk or uh, Peter Levine have written a lot about their experience with years and years working with trauma victims, um, trauma survivors, and, and so we're taking a lot of that information and trying to apply it to this kind of work. Um, yeah, I think that. Yeah, that no, that's, that's really, really great. Yeah. So I'm wondering um, how successful has this treatment been? Um, and in addition, are there specific populations, you've mentioned PTSD, for example, mm -hmm. are there specific populations of people um, who it's been more successful with? Uh, we're in the process of doing a program evaluation, so um, we will be gathering more data on the efficacy of the therapy there and making sure that what we're doing is causing long-term improvements um, and also like using that as a way to get feedback in order to improve what we're doing. Um, we have had really good success working with PTSD and, and like I said, the, the 
length of treatment varies from person to person. Um, but we, and we've also worked with people who have depression and anxiety um, and have had really good success with a pretty wide range of clinical indications. Um, it's a little less uh, effective for people with uh, personality disorders or um, bipolar disorder, depending on how severe those uh, conditions are. But, um, but you know, it's on a case-by-case -case basis, and I'd say primarily focused on PTSD, depression, and anxiety. Um, I, w I did want to mention one other thing, because you sure. said, like, you know, what's missing from other therapies, like talk therapy and things like that. Um, and I touched on it a little bit uh, in terms of, you know, how, how the psychedelics can kind of increase trust and can, um, can allow for more body to show up. But I think also um, one of the things to consider is that in traditional talk therapy, um, it can be more difficult to you know, establish a relationship or go through an entire trauma history right. with another person or a stranger. So there has to, there's like way more um, talking that has to happen. Like, hey, like I have an entire life to tell you about. Whereas in what we're doing at an eight path doesn't require you know, an entire life history in order for it to be effective. Yeah, super interesting. And I, I look forward to, you know, hopefully sometime looking at the evaluation results mm -hmm. or any of the data that you have to show. Yeah. So, great. Um, I want to switch gears a little bit. Uh, you were recently doing some field work related to 5-MeO-DMT. Uh, you've also published, co-authored some papers on 5-MeO-DMT. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I'd love for you to tell the audience a little bit more about 5-MeO-DMT, what it is, uh, what chemicals it's similar to that folks may know about, uh, and also where your interest in this stuff comes from. It's kind of an obscure drug to be interested in. Sure. So 5-MeO-DMT, so to start off, like what it is, um, it's a naturally occurring substance. Um, it's most structurally similar to serotonin. Um, it's also really similar to NNDMT, which mm -hmm. is the DMT that most people are, are familiar with that's in ayahuasca. 5-MeO-DMT, um, like I said, is naturally occurring. It likely is uh, produced in the human body naturally in super, super small amounts. Um, and, you know, it's found in a variety of plants, and it's also found in pretty high concentrations in the venom of the Buffalo Avarius toad, which, you can, which is found in the desert, like in northern Mexico, in the Sonoran Desert. Um, in terms of why I was interested in it or um, you know, what drew me to it, I think that you know, as we're moving forward and, and psychedelic-assisted therapy is becoming more and more available, um, there are some challenges that are arising. Um, some of those challenges being with psychedelics such as psilocybin or, um, you know, MDMA, those sessions would be really long. And so there's going to be, a, there's a large um, demand, there's a large need for this type of therapy. A lot of people could benefit from it. And at the same time, there's also um, a shortage of therapists and there's, a, you know, a shortage of, shortage of resources in order to provide that therapy. So with 5-MeO-DMT, it's a shorter acting experience. Um, depending on the route of administration, it can be 10 minutes long or as long as 45 minutes, depending on how it's used. Um, and so what that does, and it's kind of similar to you know, the ketamine or cannabis, you know, you're looking at a shorter acting um, experience or a shorter term you know, altered state that lends itself to better integration and, and better processing. Um, the other thing about 5-MeO-DMT, uh, one of the studies that I helped with, it produces mystical experiences really reliably. And so um, even at relatively low doses, um, it, it is able to provide mystical type experiences or experiences that have a mystical flavor which has been associated with reductions in addictive behaviors mm. and, um, and a, a wide range of other 
um, illnesses. And so there's potential in the treatment of a lot of different indications. And you know the, the anecdotal data that we're getting, the survey data, is showing that people are reporting um, improvements in a variety of mental illnesses with the use of this medicine or substance. Um, and so one of the things that's, so the shorter duration is one big advantage. Um, the fact that it's naturally occurring and that, um, that the body knows what to do with it, um, that's easily broken down and assimilated into the body, there's a chance, there's a pretty low chance for toxicity and you know, there still needs to be research to determine um, it's the levels of toxicity, if there are any. But because it's so structurally similar to psilocybin, um, and we know that that gets assimilated by the body really easily, there's that aspect as well. Um, and I think that for, for those reasons, um, it's a really interesting molecule. Yeah, so why is it Schedule One? Why is it illegal in the US? Yeah, so during the 80s, 90s, um, there was a period of time in the US where there were chemical supply companies, um, research chemical companies, essentially is kind of how it's termed. And they were producing a wide range of psychedelic substances. Um, and so they were making substances like 2CE, 2CB, mm -hmm. um, and a variety of tryptamines. And um, those included things like DPT, uh, dipropyl tryptamine, and things like Never even heard of that one. Yeah, <laughs> uh, and things like 5-MeO-DMT. Mm -hmm. And so, as you know, the use of these molecules started to grow. Um, there was a crackdown, and they just kind of blanket banned um, all kinds of substances, uh, regardless of what was going on. So, and and there were some. Um, there was some a death where someone combined 5-MeO-DMT with uh, an MAOI, mm -hmm. which is like a monoamine oxidase inhibitor, which is present in the ayahuasca vine. And um, that led to a pretty dangerous uh, effect. And so I think that because of those events and, and you know just getting that kind of legal attention, um, it was just banned without really taking much time and looking at you know, how it might be helpful. Um, and so now people are kind of going back and, and we're, you know, there's been an increase of people using 5-MeO-DMT within um, spiritual or meditative practices or even, you know, with healing intentions and are reporting really good results. And so I think it's because of that that the interest has started to come back and, um, you know, the the widespread use of, of the toad venom um, has also kind of been this way that more people have had this experience and um, are saying like, wow, there's something that was really missed when this was scheduled. Mm -hmm. And so I think that that's, that's kind of been the process of, of how it was made illegal and how it is now. Yeah, and I just want to back up a little bit. So you were talking about how um, substances like psilocybin and MDMA, we're seeing clinical trials for mm -hmm. uh, using these things for all types of um, psychological disorders. But I'm wondering, um, are you mostly interested in 5-MeO compared to these substances just because of the, the short duration? Is that why you think it's, it could be so useful? I think so. Um, I think that, I mean, that's one of the main advantages of it. Um, and like I said before, you know, in regards to cannabis and ketamine, 5-MeO-DMT, just like many other psychedelics, it, it has a lot of similar properties depending on how it's used. And so um, if we use it in similar contexts as psilocybin or MDMA, there's the possibility that it could yield pretty similar benefits. And, um, and so, you know, we need to have more research to, to verify that, but you know, that would be the hypothesis. And um, because it's a tryptamine and, and we've had research come out about tryptamines in general and, and what kinds of things they do in the body, um, there's a lot of compelling evidence and, and evidence that's, um, that's suggestive that this 
molecule could have similar or even more beneficial impacts. Moving forward, I mean, what, what research are you working on? Is there anything you can share with us about uh, what you're doing with 5-MeO and where would you like to see the research go? Sure, so right now I've mainly been working with Alan Davis um, and he's a researcher at Johns Hopkins. And so I've mainly been helping him with a survey study, which was a global survey study at, that uh, we had lots of people answer. We had over 500 respondents. And we've kind of gone through that data and, and found a lot of different um, interesting correlations and relationships between um, between different aspects of 5-MeO DMT use and it's and how it's affected different people who are using it and how they're using it um, and so kind of going through that information and seeing like okay so this is what people are reporting and and what are those reports informing the potentials for um, for future clinical applications um, and yeah that's been the main project that I've been involved with is um, not just the, the main study, but there have been also been subsets of that data that we're working on, on writing up and publishing. And in terms of how 5-MeO-DMT kind of in the future uh, research, I think it would be really great to see a, um, a cl controlled clinical trial where you know, we could have a safety study, which would be a pharmacokinetic study, and just to see, you know, is it actually as safe as it is in the naturalistic setting? Um, you know, is it viable for clinical use? And I think that if, if we're able to have clinical trials with this molecule, then um, with close observation and, and putting all the safeties in place and making sure that the protocols for it are best established for, you know, long-term healing and long-term growth, people that are using it, um, you know, I would love to see that. I think that there's enough evidence now that suggests that, you know, it would be really beneficial to pursue that and to look a little bit more deeply into what's going on and, and how it might benefit, how it might not. And, um, and there's, there's only so much that we can find out in the naturalistic setting. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think that would be one of the next things that would be really interesting to find out. Yeah, so kind of following in the footsteps of both psilocybin and MDMA. Yeah. Yeah, cool stuff, definitely. Uh, so now I'd love to talk to you about um, your involvement with the Source Research Foundation. So um, I'll just mention um, that I w received a grant recently from the Source Research Foundation, um, and Raphael happens to be on the board of this foundation, and I'd love for you to just talk about um, your role with SRF, kind of how you got involved with the organization, and also uh, what, kind of, what kind of things you're doing right now and what you hope to do in the future with the group. Yeah, it's been a, a really amazing journey being a part of Source Research Foundation, which, um, you know, is another brainchild of Alan. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I, I think the idea behind it is to empower uh, students such as yourself that are you know involved in master's programs that wouldn't otherwise provide funding for psychedelic related research uh, whether it was you know research in the humanities or you know neurological research or um, or even um, you know in the arts or whatever I, I think that there's so many people that are starting to get interested and they want to contribute to the literature and, um, and I think that SRF is, is a way to not only inspire people to continue to pursue those passions, but also give them a viable way of doing that. So that's been a really awesome mission to be a part of. And I think going forward, I think we'll definitely continue um, giving grants and you know, as long as we continue to get donations uh, that can fund those mm -hmm. grants. And uh, I think also going forward, it would be really great to create a, a sort of hub where um, you know, students could connect with researchers or researchers could find students that wanted to connect on projects that they are both passionate about, right? And you know, sometimes researchers are like, well, you know, it'd be great if we could have like three research assistants that would be willing to work for whatever exchange they agree on. Um, 
or students that are like, hey, I'm super interested in this topic, and I would really like to do you know, this kind of thing. And maybe a researcher is like, oh, I've been thinking about doing that, and you know, being able to kind of network people. So kind of seeing, like looking into the future and, and dreaming a bit farther, that, that's definitely something that would be really cool to see. Um, and right now, I think we're mainly focusing on the grants program and making sure that you know, that has stability. And, um, and yeah, I think you know, it's just super exciting to see people like yourself who are so motivated to, um, to just get more information, learn more about what these medicines have to offer, and uh, learn more about how they can be integrated not only into Western society, but also into the Western understanding of well-being. What advice do you have for either undergrad or graduate students who want to get into this stuff? It's kind of an obscure field still. Um, so if there's anything that you have to offer, I'd love for you to share. Thanks. Um, yeah, my, I think my greatest advice is just to consider that you know, the psychedelic field, just like any other field, um, it ha the same rules apply, right? Uh, it's still a lot of hard work. There's parts of it that are really boring. Um, you don't get, to, you're not taking a lot of drugs. It's, uh, it's, it's a labor of love because there's not a lot of funding for it. And it can be pretty competitive. So the best advice that I could give is to really consider like, what are my motivations for this? Um, why am I getting involved? And how does my education in a variety of other fields, like whatever it is that you're passionate about, like you're, an, you're passionate about anthropology and mm -hmm. it sounds like you have a really strong foundation in anthropology and, and you're wanting to take that a step further. And I think that that's a perfect foundation for people who want to kind of get involved with psychedelics is that there's already a good foundation. There's already a good understanding of all the things that, that lead up to the point where we enter into implementing psychedelics in some way. So, um, so like my education with counseling is, is a pretty traditional, um, you know, accredited education. And for me, that was really important to have this background and an understanding of what's currently happening, what is currently understood, and then where are the limitations of that, and then where do psychedelics fit in all of that? And so, um, for people that are at that place where they've already found, had a good foundation of knowledge and, and they're like, okay, cool, like I'm ready for this next step. Uh, the next step is really connecting to researchers and um, if, if research is what you're interested in or either researchers or therapists or whoever in your field you would look up to. You know, send them an email, get in contact with them, read their research. And after doing that, you know, connecting and, and kind of sharing why you're passionate about it. And chances are, if you're legitimately passionate and you really want to do this, um, people are want to bring more people into it. And so, um, so I think part of it is kind of putting yourself out there, taking that risk, and being willing to reach out to a lot of people before you finally make that connection with someone that's like, yeah, you know, this is a good fit and let's do something together. Um, and so I think that there is a, some level of luck involved, especially right now. And I think SRF, Source Research Foundation, we're trying to reduce that a little bit and, and make it more accessible to more people and um, legitimize that area of study. Great, great. Well, thank you so much, Raphael. I really appreciate it. Um, so that's all for today's segment. You've been watching Getting High on Anthropology. Um, I'm Lucia Turpak, filling in for Marty Otanias. Thanks, Marty, for allowing me to have a segment on the show. Um, this was really, really wonderful. Hope you tune in next time.